Uh, the Nigerian born international scammer and Instagram celebrity Ramon Abbas, also known as Hush Puppy, is still facing trial in the United States of America for advance fee fraud. Prior to his arrest and extradition to the U.S. last year, he was alleged to be the ringleader of a gang of fraudsters that facilitated computer intrusion, business email compromise, fraud and money laundering from his base in Dubai. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, which had been on this trail for years, said his victims, mostly in the U.S., had been duped of hundreds of millions of dollars. If convicted, Abbas could spend the next 20 years in a U.S. federal prison. Well, let me get to the latest update on his last court appearance on Tuesday. From the head, Judicial Human Rights and Anti-Corruption Desk of uh, Premium Times, Ade, Ade Somoju, and uh, popular blogger and social media commentator, Dr. Kemiolu Loyo, we will be following the trial virtually. Welcome to the show, Kemi and Ade. I mean, Kemi, you could start first and just give us an update, and Ade will give us an update afterwards. And it's a pleasure to have both of you. Good morning. Rafai, good morning. Thank you so much for having me on Arise. Yes. Good morning. Good morning. So, Kemi, you go first. An, an update of what, well, is, what is happening. Basically, I broke the story last year when they arrested him that evening. And then there was a point when I started connecting with all the Dubai reporters at the Gulf Times. And a lot of them would give, give me information back and forth as an investigative journalist. Now, what I did basically was, you know, I just stood by on what was going on. Twelve people were arrested. And then I got a tip that they were going to America. But it wasn't all 12. Two of them, Olali Kampanle Woodbury, another socialite on Instagram, and Hush Wapi. So I kept updating the fact that that they are not even in Dubai anymore. Those two were in, you know, America. And I was trying to really find out how they got them there because UAE and Nigeria don't have extradition, excuse me, UAE and America don't have extradition treaties. So I discovered they went by extraordinary rendition. And the two that went were Hush Puppy and Woodbury. Now, the bottom line is this. When they got to the United States, there were all kinds of accusation charges. Remember, Nigerians were still bent on the fact that they were in Dubai. And some of our local newspapers were actually reporting that they're going to be extradited. Hush Puppy was going to be extradited to Nigeria. So it's very hard when you're an independent journalist and you have a mainstream paper saying something else. People don't want to believe you. Okay, so when they got to America, they were transferred to MCC, Metropolitan Correction Center in Chicago. And while they held them there, they were putting the charges together, the FBI. I had sources in the FBI. I had sources in the United States Secret Service and even the State Department. These crimes were a small Internet syndicate that turned into an elaborate heist. That's how I describe it. One simple Internet scam. When Yahoo! Yahoo! started, you had all our young people on computers coercing people to give them passwords, to give them advance fees. My dad's a, you know, my dad's a famous prince. He has oil and I want to get it out, blah, blah, blah. But this is what they call serious internet scam, mostly BEC, business email compromise, where they hack into company computers, companies' emails, and they take out huge amounts of money. Now, talking about heist, how do you enter a company's um, whatever? They fish into it. The word is fishing, and I want to use this opportunity on Horizon to actually say it. It's fishing. Our young people call it fizing. Oh, let's do some fizing. It's fishing. They fish into the computers. When they enter the computers of these companies, they don't steal right away. They sit there for two to three weeks to monitor how the companies are getting their invoices out, how the CEO is ordering money from the finance department downstairs, and and how everything is working. When they study it well, they now clone the website of the company. They get into the email, okay, of these CEOs and these finance department and trick them into sending money. And one of the main cases in this hush puppy case was that of a law firm who was refunding $922,000 back to their client. Their client refinanced a piece of real estate and they were getting that money back. The paralegal, in the documents that the FBI put together, the paralegal, KC, is her initial. She was tricked into sending that money to a bank account, a Chase bank account, which actually belonged to Hush Puppy and not the client. $100 million from Premier, a Premier League soccer club. The FBI wouldn't tell us which one it is. I have people working in the FBI, and I have 
FBI sources who will tell me things. You know, Kemi, don't mention my name. So putting all the sources in the FBI and the Secret Service, the United States Secret Service, broke the part of the story that had to do with the COVID ventilators. There were two people, okay, two people in this scam that orchestrated it. A Canadian-American called Galeb Alomari and the second person was Hushwapi. Galeb was the one doing all the hacking with his boys. He had all kinds of Romanian hackers, North Korean hackers working for him. And Hushwapi was the one moving the money, laundering it with a lot of Nigerian young men working in his house. There was a room where they took 129 laptops and 47 phones. So they were doing the money part. He was doing the hacking part. Now there was a point in which one of our OAPs here, Daddy Freeze, visited Dubai. And last year he used that opportunity to visit Hush Puppy and wanted a tour of that house. So while they were eating dinner, if you go back to that video, you'll notice a part where Hush Puppy actually got up to go away into the room to make a phone call. That phone call, the FBI played it to us, okay? He left Freeze in the dining table, but he went to make that phone call. What's up, bro? That's Hush Puppy. Alomari, I'm on the plane. We're about to land. The signal is poor. 922,000 came in, okay? Big money came okay. in. He said, okay, send me the screenshot. Okay, when I get to the terminal, the plane will, you know, when the plane gets to the terminal, the signal is back, the network. Okay. So Hush Puppy wanted the screenshot. So as Alomari got out of the plane, the FBI caught him, and that was the end of it. Now, when they caught Alomari, was it Alomari that outed Hushwapi? Possibly. But also, Alomari's boys just got out $100 million from the COVID ventilator money. All right, Madam Kami, uh, let, let me just tell you to hold on there. We'll come back to you sure. uh, shortly. Let's sure. bring in Ade, Ade Shumoju into this conversation as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as you have heard, and as we know, so uh, to a large extent, these were massive, sophisticated scams. But it would seem a dispute between members of the syndicate was their undoing. What exactly do we know about that dispute? How was all of this busted? Like, um, Kemi has done justice to the facts leading to the case. Uh, we, 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 Ni Nigerians were, you know, Hush, Hush Puppy has been a figure. Uh, many Nigerians, particularly the youth, have been looking up to. People wanted to be like him. He attributes his successes in businesses uh, to hard work and the grace of God and all of that. So uh, he was a, a sort of a role model. And when, like, uh, don't get me uh, laid out, we, when the facts came, and uh, the stories, you know, c came out, and Nigerians were really, uh, really wanted to know what was really going on. And uh, because of that, Premium Times devoted a lot of resources and human capital, you know, monitoring the development, uh, uh, especially uh, at the point where it got to court. You see, uh, we cannot but emphasize uh, at this stage uh, how sophisticated the, the crime. Hush Puppy was caught in was is a, is a, is a transnational uh, network of criminals. Yes, you know, um, hacking into emails across the world, duping people of millions of dollars. Uh, in, uh, as it is today, uh, about $25 million uh, have been uh, linked to Hush Puppy alone. So, you, but you see the sophisticated uh, crime being matched with sophisticated law enforcement and the judiciary. Osh Mopi was arrested in uh, Dubai in June. By June 25, a charge was already pending in the US. And like uh, Kemi said, the, the, he was actually expelled. There was no extradition uh, a law between the US and, and Dubai. So he was expelled from, the, from Dubai and handed over to uh, the FBI and brought to the US. By July 2, he landed in the US. And by August uh, 1 or 2, he was already in court, pleaded, pleading guilty. You know? And along the line, uh, other crimes have been unraveled uh, involving him. And you know, to show, you, to tell you how, I mean, where law is setting, law enforcement and efficient, things are, I mean, clockwork efficient. You see that uh, by January, uh, when he pleaded guilty in August, by January, he changed his lawyer. I mean, February, he changed his lawyer. 
And in fact, we were already, he was, we were already preparing for the trial. He changed his lawyer in February, and the, the lawyer, that's Louis Shapiro, in, sometimes in March, wrote the court and asking for uh, the dates to be shifted from May to, to uh, I mean, to July, which was yesterday. I mean, uh, along the line, the U.S. I mean, government applied to the court to allow them to have some information, pieces of information on the documents to be handed over to uh, the defense, redacted so that it will, uh, you know, the norm names of uh, co-conspirators that had yet to be arrested, identities, addresses, and all of that technical strategy deployed in prosecuting the case will also be shielded from the public. And that order was granted. So we were all uh, expecting uh, to, uh, for trial uh, yesterday when we saw this. So this, that is where we are. And um, as you go through the plea agreement he had with the United States government, he will be pleading guilty at a time to be fixed because uh, he will still be brought to court to, plead, to officially plead guilty to change his former a not guilty plea to guilty. And after then, there will be a sentencing hearing. So I think that is where we are currently. Well, Ade, uh, thank you very much uh, for those details. But two quick things. How did Premium Times manage to focus so much attention on that story without necessarily being on the ground in the United States? Uh, maybe there's something you can tell us about that. But more importantly, uh, Premium Times has a story about the plea bargain. Uh, that uh, Hushpapi has entered into. Uh, if you could also uh, help us outline the details of uh, that uh, plea bargain. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Bati. Um, of course, uh, Hushpapi, the kinds of Hushpapi around the world, uh, Nigerians, uh, I mean, young Nigerians like him, we have many Nigerians doing well all across the world, but we also have a few of them who are actually giving Nigeria uh, the bad name that uh, people are quick to remember. Uh, uh, when Oshpopi was arrested, it was a, a, a mixed feeling here. Uh, people, some people saw, people, I mean, the kind, considered the kind of influence that he commanded. A lot of Nigerians, a lot, many Nigerians actually was saying, some were even saying they were lying against him. So. It was a huge, an issue of public interest, and few times as we are known for, uh, saw it as an issue that we need to hi really highlight, focus on, to really tell the world, I mean, to tell Nigerians uh, what really happened, how bad this guy has done to our image as a country. So we deploy resources, we deploy focused attention. We, I mean, we had network of journalists that we worked with, getting documents uh, to have an accurate reporting on all the issues, blow by blow, um, up to what we had yesterday. Yes, talking about the plea bargain, uh, I think um, one other thing that uh, you know, jumps out uh, when I was reading to the document yesterday was how the judiciary, but the, the judiciary, the law enforcement, I mean, how, what, uh, the, the diligence, the sophistication, the dedication, and the resources they actually put in um, uh, 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 combating crimes. This is a crime that was described by the FBI as one of their most difficult form of cybercrime. The FBI said in, in 2019 alone, they lost, a, 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 there was a record of a, a, a sum of $1.7 billion lost to business it may compromise form of crime alone when uh, the, 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 the hackers get into the business email of companies they take charge of the, 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 the conversations they, 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 they block the email although they divert communication so they take advantage of ongoing conversations with business partners and unknowing to the victims the, the, the communication will continue thinking and they will not provide an account where funds that are meant to fund a particular project that was being discussed will be paid into. You see, so this is where this is what this is what really happened. Okay. If you look at the the, okay. the, the plea bag, I mean the plea bag, okay. you know, you know that. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just go ahead. Just finish up that thought, Adi. Before yeah, I yeah, the plea bag. You see, yeah, yeah. You see in the plea bag the the intention 
of government, law enforcement agencies to actually combat, I mean, to use crime to be, I mean, to, to use prosecution to be a form of deterrence to people. You see, the, 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 a lot of rights have been waived that have, you know, the, the rights to, right to appeal, right to have speedy trial, right to, you know, a lot of rights, constitutional rights that are, that are supposed to ennial mm. to a defendant have been waived. And if you look at okay. it, you know, unlike what we have here, okay, where Ade. people okay. go into plea bargain, okay. ju just to... Okay, Ade, let, let me bring Kemi in here. So, Kemi, I mean, what are the other things we should know as regards this case, I mean, you, you and Adi, you've done an extensive um, and very good job as regards bringing this out. So what are the other connections? Uh, some other names, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, the likes of Woodbury. Uh, I think there was also the case of Mofa, you know. Um, Mofa is not related to this case. Okay, it's not related Mofa to this case. Mofa is a BDC operator, and he actually works for his uncle. Okay. So his own case is with the EFCC. Okay. Now, what I wanted to say yeah. on what Adi said, okay, what Adi said really needs to be taken very seriously. Premium Times is a newspaper that really focuses on investigative journalism. And for me personally, I did said some things on the point of the media. Only Premium Times myself and you arise now analyzing it really, really touch this case in deep. And if the government, okay, has to look at the bigger picture, if they ask me, what do you want us to do? I will say, bring the Premium Times guy myself Okay, and let us sit with the ministers for technology, the ministers for finance, and the ministers for foreign affairs on a round table to discuss how this can stop. It is not just hush puppy, it's a lot of Nigerians. Now, Rufai, Dr. Abati, Adesua, are you aware that last night I got more documents from the FBI of this wristwatch that was purchased in January, February, and sent to hush puppy in Dubai? for millions, millions, millions of dollars of Nairas. This people that orchestrated that particular part of the scam, if you read the page nine of the 29 documents of the plea agreement, you will see it there. These were like four girls, four women, and three guys in the United States. They just arrested them last week, July 22nd. So the arrests are still coming in, you know? Now let me tell you one part of that whole COVID thing. The $100 million, um, $100 million were for ventilators for COVID. And what Donald Trump wanted was to put that funds. Those funds were going through the United States Secret Service. They're another elite law enforcement agency. When Alamari hacked into it reportedly, the $100 million came out. The $30 million, 30% 30 is Hush Puppy's money. And the 70% is Alamari and his boys. So when Hush Puppy had heard, this is according to an FBI source, when Hush Puppy had heard that they've captured Alamari, rather than just go la down low, lay low, whatever, he double-crossed, okay? According to my source, he allegedly double-crossed Alamari's boys of that 70 million and kept the whole hundred. Out of greed, those boys were the ones that tipped the FBI off on the entire operation. And they found a way to start looking for Hush Puppy. And then Hush Puppy flashed everything and all that. This is one of the reasons why he fired... Jill Pisetsky and Vicky Podebreski, the two first, law, you know, the first two lawyers who are saying, oh, our client was kidnapped, a client is an influencer, that wouldn't work. I know Louis Shapiro, he's a very good lawyer. And I said it on my Instagram page, when Shapiro gets in there, he's just gonna tell the feds, plea deal. And this is the problem we're having now with Woodbury. Olale Konkonle, the second in command. This is the boy that was in South Africa. Konkonle was in South Africa and he fled South Africa because they wanted to kill him. There was one particular Yahoo over there called Ali Baba. It was a big BEC, and a lot of money came out of it. And I heard our boys, you know, were gonna share that money, and Woodbury reportedly fled Dubai when he heard they're gonna kill him. He didn't wanna release the money. They were gonna kill him, the cultist boys. And they, he fled to Dubai and moved with Hush Puppy. When he got to Dubai, he settled the boys. But at the end of the day, the BEC emails and the scams were still on Woodbury's phone. And that's why he's having a trouble now with his trial in Chicago. They have another lawyer that they've added to that case. I'm covering that too. The next date is August 6th. His name is Thomas Durkin. And Durkin is another very good lawyer. They're paying these lawyers huge amounts of sums. And Woodbury is in what they call a proffer, where they'll sit down with the feds and all that. And Woodbury has still not done that plea agreement. He needs to do the plea agreement because they'll give him 10 years because he's facing 30 years. 10 instead of 30. Like Obi Okeke, you know Obi Wani Okeke. He confessed and they gave him 10 instead of 30. So 
this whole BEC stuff from South Africa was still on Woodbury's phone, and the lawyers have looked at it. So we're hoping on August 6th they'll decide to do a plea agreement too. If you notice, Hush Puppies plea agreement was done in April, April 7th, and they just released it to us. They released it to us on the day of the trial two days ago. We are calling it, Premium Times and myself, we're calling into that system, PACER, P-A-C-E-R, United States Federal Court you know, system. They actually did PESA because of coronavirus. Okay. You dial in, you're accredited, you put your co code, you can hear everything Tell in the me, courtroom. For want of time, I want to really chip in more questions here. Sure. Um, you've been following this case. Premium Times has told us why they decided to go after this. Yes. What jumped at you? Why did you decide to follow this case? And if you could just answer as well, for a lot of Nigerians, or some Nigerians, this did not come as a surprise with the luxurious lifestyle Hush Puppy was flaunting on social media platforms. But why do you think anybody should pay attention to this case? Okay, Adesua, I mean, let's get personal. You asked me why did I get into this case. One, I'm a journalist. Number two, the same question BBC asked me in London. BBC London called me. They noticed that Hush Puppy and I had some interaction, okay? I was curious. I wanted to follow what was going on. The interaction was years ago, you know, when I came out of Potakwa prison, when I was detained. I was sick, very ill, and I had a huge medical bill, and I had to treat myself. So I did a fundraiser online, and I started going to the DMs of famous stars, people that had money, okay? I'm blunt. I needed the money. So I went to Hush Puppy's page, and I sent him a message, and I did a post and he said, I have to apologize to a certain blogger before, before he could give me money. I apologized to the blogger. The post is still on his page. I apologized to the blogger and he didn't give me the money. And I called him. I said, you're a scammer. Okay, you scammed me. You let me apologize to my nemesis and you scammed me. At the end of the day, I said something that some people picked up. You're a scammer. So when I heard this stuff, it came from one of the people in that house, Palazzo Versace, that afternoon, 4 o'clock, our time, 7 Dubai said they just arrested Hush Puppy. They just raided the house. They just, you know, and that's how I broke the story. Then I followed it since then. And then one of the reporters at the Gulf called me and said, hey, Kemi, Hush Puppy going to America tomorrow. I'm speaking with his Arab accent. He said, Hush Puppy going to America. How? Extraordinary rendition. I mean, activists don't like it. They'll pull you for a third country, from a third country. Look where Hush Puppy is. He's with the U.S. Marshals. He's not in a prison. You know where the marshals are? They have two locations that I know of. One in Colorado, underground bunkers. They have a whole city under the ground. And the other one, Florida, in the middle of the ocean. Helicopters come and go. They can't escape. It's for dangerous fugitives. That's what they classified Hush Puppy as. And then I saw the charging documents. I saw the crimes. I saw everything. So I would say this case is going to end up with a sentence of... Well, I'm not God and I'm not a judge, but with my FBI sources, all the U.S. law enforcement sources, and even sources in the U.S. Embassy. The U.S. Embassy here in Victoria Island has an FBI attache in there, and they have, because they're doing that because it, it has changed everything about getting a visa. Two weeks ago, some of our children who got I-20 visas are stealing 1.7 million, withdrawing it at ATM. We saw them. So the embassy has to be very careful who's getting the visas, and we want them not to let these kids be affected. The ones that are actually going to school are not doing Yahoo. And so with that being said, I'm looking at 15 years for Hush Puppy. Good behavior, uh, clean, mop, do dishes, be good to other inmates, be respectful. He'll get out in 15 years. Oh. Now, after that 15 years, real quick, I know we don't have time, but after that 15 years, you got another big problem, okay? St. Nevis and Kitts, St. Christopher and Kitts, the passport he's carrying, they're going to revoke this passport. A law, uh, I no, mean, a government official is telling me. Okay, lawyer. because proceeds of the crime purchase that passport. So we now have to look at investment passports. People can buy a passport for 150000 Yes. Yeah, we have, uh, you know, just about a minute to go. Okay. Many young people look up to the likes of Invictus, Hoshpapi, Woodbury. Uh, what will you say to those young people who well, regard this, these persons as heroes? in their own view, and they, they want to be like them. What I say to them, I'm already saying it to them. Leave this Yahoo alone, okay? So it brings up the bigger picture, all right? We need money. We want the federal government. I'm saying this now on Arise, and I thank you for giving me this platform. We need the federal government to give us money. I did a creation, content creation seminar two weeks ago. This is a 50,000 Naira seminar. They don't have that to pay me. They don't have 30,000. I did it for 10000 and some people did it. Others want to do it. We don't make money from this. But if the government puts this funding out for people like us, my headgear is coming out, for people like us, 
that have this training. Let us teach them how to blog, how to create content, how to do comedy skits, how to monetize it, how to make money on the internet instead of them trying to steal, steal, steal all the time. This is what I'm telling the government. This next election, 2023, put our money to the people that can help the youth. Look at the boy from Abeg Technologies, two billion invested in Big Brother Nigeria and Patricia, another one billion there. Young people sponsoring, the regular sponsors, you know, the detergent companies and all that, 200 million, they beat them out. Tech is the new oil, let us use it well. Let's teach these kids to stop stealing with tech. And let the police know. We want the police and the EFCC to know that if they're carrying a laptop, it, they don't need to be profiled. It is not always Yahoo. Let us help these children. My children are not American, not Nigerian. They're American. Two over there, one here. Okay? But these children here in Nigeria are Nigerians like me. And this is my country. Let me help them. They have nowhere to go. All right. Well, thank you but very thank, much, thank you so much. Uh, Ade Adeshomoju and uh, Kemi Olunloyo. Thank you, thank you thank very you much for joining us. Thank you, Rufai. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.